what person do I want to meet if I went back in time? Right. It'll be the scientist, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, a uh, British scientist. He was a professor at University of Cambridge. He held the endowed chair that Stephen Hawking now holds, the Lucasian professor of mathematics. And he was a physicist. Today, we would think of him as a physicist. Back then, he was what's known as a natural philosopher who posed questions about the natural world as opposed to the human world. They're human philosophical questions, you know, like the meaning of life and this sort of thing. Then they're natural philosophical questions. What is the origin of the universe and of the world? So Isaac Newton uh, was brilliant. And I, I own most of anything he's ever written. And I sit there and I read it. And, and as I read the sentences he put to page, hair goes up on the back. I don't actually have hair there, but I feel it. If it would, you feel like the goose bumpy kind of thing. If I had hair on my neck, it would be standing on edge as I see the depth to which he was connected to the operations of nature. There is no doubt about it. The man discovered the laws of gravity by sitting there. Okay, it's rumored that he sat under the apple tree, but what is certain is that he knew in the same field of view, he saw an apple drop and the moon in orbit around the earth. Okay, he sees the two of them. One is falling to the ground and the other is like up there in space. He connects the two and suggests that the same force of gravity is operating on both of them. They're both falling towards Earth, he hypothesizes. Well, how is that possible? Because I can drop this camera on the ground, <laughs> it would fall, okay? But if it's in orbit, it's not falling. But it is falling, it is. If you're in orbit, you are falling towards Earth. You know, the, he drew a diagram to illustrate this. In fact, that diagram is on the wall over there called orbits. There's someone whose head is in front of the orbit now, who's <laughs> typing on his head. There's orbits, there's a whole orbit panel where we describe this, but I'll do it for you because I'm here in person, all right? He suggested, suppose you had a hill and you sort of fire a cannonball. Not very fast, it would just sort of kind of fall, right? Fire it a little faster. It goes farther before it hits the ground, doesn't it? Even faster, it'll go even farther. Now wait a minute, Earth is curved. So if you keep this up, this thing is coming around the backside of the Earth. So he asked himself, there must be a speed sufficiently high so that that cannonball comes right back to the cannon. And all you have to do at that point is duck. And the, or, the cannonball ought to just slide on by and stay in orbit. The fact is the cannonball is falling every moment it's there. The difference is it's going sideways so fast that the amount that it has fallen is the same amount that the Earth's surface has curved away from it. That is the speed that gets you orbit. He figures this out. And that's why the moon is behaving the same way the apple is. The apple just doesn't happen to have sideways motion to bring it someplace other than right below. And when you are in free fall, you are weightless. That's the coolest thing to be. We have in our midst an astronaut. We have Tom Hendrick. Hendrick, where are you? Raise your hand, please stand up. An official astronaut, okay? <laughs> On uh, several shuttle missions. So you gotta admit, being weightless was cool. It's cool. <laughs> well, you gotta put that on, on microphone. It's cool, Neil. There we go. <laughs> and so he's in free fall around the Earth. Not only is the shuttle orbiter in free fall, everything in the orbiter is in free fall. So therefore, everything is weightless. Now, if you're in an elevator and you cut the elevator cable, um, up until the point you hit the bottom, you are weightless. You're in free fall. Uh, here's an experiment you do. It's the, a very cool, cheap experiment. Take a tall glass of water in a paper cup. Make sure it's tall. One of those that Starbucks will it'll cost you eight bucks to get it. But you'll get a tall <laughs> cup. Fill it with water. Punch holes in the side. Obviously, the water's going to leak out. The water at the bottom hole will spew out farther than the water in, higher, in, in holes higher because the water weighs more above it. There's more pressure at the bottom to, to spray the water out. So the, the bottom one is far and the higher ones are a little less. It's all because of water pressure, the weight of the water. Take that cup of water while it's spilling, drop it into a sink. It doesn't matter what you drop it into, but this is to minimize mess. Drop it. The instant it leaves your hand, it is weightless because it's in free fall. 
The cup is weightless, the water is weightless. And if the water has no weight, then the water does not know to exit the hole in the side of the cup that you punctured. So the instant you drop that cup, the water cuts off. It just stops. And the cup falls, hits the bottom, and spills in your sink. But while it fell, it is evidence that the water became weightless. The apple is weightless, the moon is weightless. That was Isaac Newton. On top of that, he discovers the laws of motion. Famous equation, F equals MA. You may remember that from high school physics or not. It's an important equation. You combine F equals MA and the laws of gravity, it gets us to the moon. It allows us to aim projectiles and land where we want on Mars. He also discovered the then known laws of optics. Put light through a prism, show that white light is composed of colors. He named the colors of the rainbow. Roy G. Biv. Roy, you know Roy G. Biv? Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow. Keep going. Green. green. Blue. Yeah. Purple. <laughs> Was there P in Roy G. Biv's name? <laughs> Actually, it's purple to some people, but to Isaac Newton, it, it was... Violet. You left, left out the I. Indigo. Indigo. So he threw in... The, Isaac Newton had a mystical fascination with the number seven, and so there really, to most people, only six colors there. He threw in indigo. So, plus it spells Roy G. Biv. You can't, you can't give that up. Um, so he puts these through, and here's colors coming out of white light. This freaked out the artists, right? Because that's not how colors work in art. And then he took the colors, put them back together, got white light again. So he understood the behavior of light, of these different um, bands. And so he came up with the laws of optics, laws of gravity, laws of motion, and on a dare, practically on a dare, he invented integral and differential calculus. <laughs> on a dare. Somebody said, Ike, why do the planets orbit in this shape we call ellipses? An ellipse, a flattened circle. Why that shape? He said, you know, I don't know. It comes out of my equations, but I don't know why it's that shape and not some other. I'll get back to you. So he goes home for a couple of months, comes back. Here's, the, here's why it's that shape. Well, it's actually a cut from a cone. Take a cone and make cuts in it. You get an ellipse, a circle, a parabola, a hyperbola. It's math people know this. This guy would know that who got the arithmetic good earlier. Okay? So then, then the friend said, well, how did you, that's cool. How did you figure that out? Well, I invented calculus to, to find the answer. <laughs> Most people are struggling with it just to learn it in school. He invents it for no other reason but a friend of him posed a challenging question. Isaac Newton, after all of this, then turns 26. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, when I read Newton, I commune through time and feel connected to the cosmos. I have a bust of his head on my um, I have a table in my office, and there's a bust of his head there. Not his actual head, just it's a <laughs> casting of his head. So, let's go in the back, in the middle, and I think you have a white sweater on, yes. Um, is it possible to tunnel through a black hole, like quantum mechanics? Can a black hole be used to travel? How about that? Can we say that? No, no, it's a little different. Like, <laughs> Steve, get, can with, you get with the Get with it. Tunnel through a black hole. Yes. As if it creates a tunnel in space or time? Quantum mechanically is what you say. Quantum mechanically, can you tunnel through a black hole? I'm not going to try to interpret this one. Uh, well, I have to ask, did you want to land someplace else when you're done, or are you content with being dead when it's over? <laughs> I need to know before I answer. I guess it's okay if I die. It's okay if you die. Um, for science. For science. Stephen Hawking showed just recently that, and for me this was kind of spooky amazing, that black holes remember everything that they have ever eaten, which means it's not a tunnel to anywhere. Everything that it ate is sitting there at the singularity at its center. Now, the spooky part, that's not the spooky part. The spooky part is Stephen Hawking showed 40 years ago that black holes can actually evaporate. The matter that's within a black hole can rise up out of the gravitational field that surrounds it and spontaneously birth a pair of particles. That's just E equals MC squared doing its thing. E equals MC squared. The, if the gravity field has high energy density, out of that pops particles. And those particles escape, taking matter away from the black hole. 
from the from the gravity field of the black hole. Doesn't like, that fly in the face of what we, how we think of a black hole? Yes. In a black hole, gone forever. It, it, because nothing escapes, because nothing has, nothing can uh, surpass the energy needed to go faster than the speed of light. Except quantum mechanics, this quantum physics from the 1920s gets you out of that problem. That's a classical understanding of black holes. You layer quantum mechanics on it, weird stuff happens. Completely legitimately weird stuff happens. So you birth these particles outside the thing. Now here's what happens. I dump you. That sounds like, that. I'm not interrupting, that sounds like a science is making magical exceptions for itself. It, quantum physics is kind of magic because none of it issues forth from your common sense. Particles pop in and out of existence. One time it's a wave, the next time it's a particle, and it interacts with itself. And, pop, and, and you measure it here, but it shows up there. If we were forged in that world, then all that would be common sense. And equals MC squared would be a, da a daily phenomenon. You wouldn't need Einstein to figure it out. He'd be learning it in elementary school. But that is a foreign universe to us. And so what goes on there, you are prone to say, that doesn't make sense. You know something? It's of a no, no obligation to make sense to you because your senses didn't come out of that universe, out of that universe of tiny particles. We don't live there. If you let something go and it drops, you say, that makes sense. If you let something go and it goes up, you say, that doesn't make sense. In quantum world, that happens all the time. It would make sense in the quantum world. So I submit to you that if I take your body and dump it into a black hole, what Stephen Hawking showed is that all the particles that went into the black hole, let's say it's Stephen Colbert black hole, OK? No other contaminating bodies but your atoms in the center of this black hole. And I wait around. And out here in the gravity field, particles pop into existence. And I check, make a check. How many protons? How many neutrons? How many electrons? How many neutrinos? By the time this black hole was evaporated, it would have been every single particle that you were having fallen in in the first place, extracted out of the energy field of the black hole. So it remembers who you were even out in, in the gravitational field. That's spooky to me. <laughs> I, I'm the black side. hole now gone. 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 Just it pops out of existence. Evaporated. It takes, by the way, it takes several trillion years for that, so don't wait around for it. It's that young man right there. How do you figure all this out? <laughs> okay. How do you figure all this out? Uh, it's an excellent question. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah. Isaac Newton did it all by himself. He was like really, really, really smart. A quick Isaac Newton story. He discovered, he discovered laws of motion, laws of gravity. It just shows that planets don't orbit in circles, as Copernicus had thought, but in slightly flattened circles we call ellipses. And, and so a friend of his said, Ike, why? That may be quite a little bit. Why, why that shape and not some other shape? <laughs> he couldn't answer that question. He's, I'll get back to you. Goes home for two months, comes back. Here's why it's that shape. The conic section that cuts through the thing. They said, well, how did you figure that out? He said, well, I had to invent integral and differential calculus to figure it out. <laughs> so some people invent their own tools and methods to discover the world. Most people learn the tools from someone else, and then apply them to make incremental changes. Some people make huge changes, like Isaac Newton and, 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 and Einstein and, and others. Isaac Newton once said, if I can see farther than others, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants who have come before me. But I've read Isaac Newton, and I'm saying to myself, that quote cannot have possibly have been honest. <laughs> what it really meant, if I, I, I read, give that quote to him, I'd say, if I can see farther than others, it's because I'm standing among midgets, that's why. He can see farther than everybody else. In the case of Isaac Newton. If you could meet and talk with any scientist who's ever lived, who would it be and why? Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton. Why? No question about it. Isaac Newton. The smartest person ever, ever to walk the face of this earth.